49. Many of the people in the top 100 are barely breaking even, sometimes in the red. If you're not playing at Grand Slams consistently and doing well, you're struggling. When I grew up, I always watched tennis. So watching William's sisters and everything, my sister and I, we grew up playing together. And so I always wanted to be like Venus and Serena. So I come from Poland, which is, uh, you know, not a huge tennis culture. I would, I would say my mom used to play tennis and then that's, you know, how I started when I wanted to, you know, become one of the best players in the world. I was the first number one junior in 37 years, female, and kind of all my dreams started coming true. The perception versus the reality, like tennis does look very glam and it looks like so polished. The highest paid this and these big purses and these big prize money tournaments. You really don't see the struggle. That was something that I didn't really understand until I got to that level. And then once I got into the top 100, then my ranking fell to 400. And then that was the time when I had to go back to playing like the really low level events and I didn't know how I was gonna pay my bills. I told my coach like, there were times like, hey, I can't pay you or I can't pay for training this week or can you pay for your flight? And then, you know, I got you when we get to the slam and like when we get to the bigger tournament. So the structure of tennis is, is pretty unique in the sports landscape. There's a men's tour, the ATP. There's a women's tour, the WTA. There's four Grand Slams, which are each really independently owned and operated. There's the International Tennis Federation, which is like the global governing body that governs things like the Olympics and some of the more global aspects of tennis. And you have this really disjointed structure. When you add it all up, it has left not only the players behind and made it something that is not anywhere close to where it should be in relation to other sports. I think the total revenue of tennis could be better. The percentage that the players are getting, I think that you know, that's also some issue. The tournaments are sharing about 18% of the revenue with the players. In many of those other sports, hockey, American football, soccer, you see a revenue share that is much closer to 50%. As a player, sometimes it is frustrating because you know that you're the talent and you know that you're bringing this certain level of entertainment to all of these different places around the world and not being compensated for it. Tennis is a sport where there are no teams. And so it, if anything, that revenue share should be higher in tennis, given the fact that people are coming to see player A play against player B. Carlos Alcaraz has made the most money on either the men's tour or the women's tour last year, about $10 million, who is, by the way, a generational talent who won an incredible amount of matches last year. And let's asterisk that for a second, because that's gross. That's before he pays his own travel, his coaches, his physios, all the expenses that tennis players bear alone, that no athlete in a team sport or other sports like F1 have to bear. And if you look at $10 million, how that translates in basketball, that's roughly the 150th highest paid player in the NBA. And then you look at football, American football, that's 202nd highest salary. In baseball, it's a similar story where it's in the hundreds out of a six, 700 player community at the major league level. That graphic is like tattooed in my head because it's astonishing to me. There are a lot more players that are struggling than the ones that aren't. A good friend of mine, Dustin Brown, a very, very good player. He literally was living out of his car. He was stringing rackets for the players at the tournament to make money. And sometimes the amount that he was making to string rackets was more than he made in his prize money. And he beat Nadal at Wimbledon, like played one of the most epic matches. And the pressure always gets spun around and put on the vent. Well, if you just won more, you'd be fine. So what's your problem? 
Well, if you weren't in the 200s or 300s, well then you'd have nothing to complain about. As opposed to, hey, wait a second, in all these other global sports, if I'm in the 200s, 300s, I'm actually well entrenched as a professional athlete. Why isn't that the case in tennis? It's one of the only sports where we're not salary-based players. Your pay is based on your performance. The way those other sports are structured, the players are employees. And so when you're an employee, you have a minimum salary. And part of the problem with tennis is that the players, despite working 11 and a half months a year and traveling the globe, are treated as independent contractors. I guess people who don't have endorsements, they only make their money from tournaments. And I don't think that that should be a thing. I think we should make like salary for the year. I'm fortunate to have uh, you know, a couple of great sponsors. Morika Watch uh, while I play. Actually, this, this, watch, this watch while I play. Also, I'm, I'm playing with a Yonex racket and a Yonex outfit and having a patch on my sleeve of Easy Posts. I'm sponsored by ASICS at the moment. They send you a package of clothes to wear at different tournaments. That's based on your ranking and uh, also your profile as a player. And if you're 200 in the world, maybe, you know, maybe there's a local company from your country that wants to help you, wants to support you. But if you're outside of top 50, you will have a clothing deal, you will have a racket deal, but it would be tough to have a real source of income outside of a tennis court. And in my particular situation, I don't have any sponsors. So like all of my expenses come out of my prize money. In traveling with a couple of people around the world, you know, you fly always last minute and uh, yeah, you sleep in the hotels, you eat in the, you know, restaurants. Those, those expenses are, are really, you know, really significant. Maybe a coaching year is around 75,000 without expenses. So for hotel, flights, all that, it could add up. There's so much emphasis on the Grand Slams because these four times a year, only four, are where you get basically the biggest payout. When you're at the lower rankings or you're like trying to break through, like you kind of have to go everywhere because you need to get points, you need to get money. Points are literally everything. I mean, that's how our rankings are determined. And every tournament has a certain point value and every round has a certain point value. So at the Grand Slams is where you can make the most points and the lower level tournaments, like the 250s or even like challengers. The lower you drop down, the less point opportunities that you have to make. So it's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Oftentimes the expenses outweigh the pay. The sport hasn't kept pace with other sports. The players and, and what they generate from an income standpoint hasn't kept pace. The protections are non-existent. There's no safety net, there's no minimum. Because what happens if you get hurt? What happens if you, you, you want to take a break. What happens if you want to have a child? There's, there's no mechanism for that other than putting 100% of that burden on the player. Fortunately, my parents were, were able to, to help me a lot with my career and uh, so I'm really thankful to them. If you don't have support, it's, it's really, really challenging. The risk is that we can miss out on really unique and amazing talents and people who are very, very good because they can't afford to play. Players like Ans, Chabur, she didn't have those opportunities growing up in Tunisia. Francis Tiafo, I mean, those are players who made it, despite those challenges made it. What about all the other players that didn't? I'm trying to identify and really get clear on like, how can I make the biggest difference? I feel like if I don't do that or if I don't try, like I'm wasting all the things that I've been through and, and the lessons that I learned, like I want to pass that on to as many people as I can. And if I can shape a next generational talent, I will love that.